Well, thank you all for joining us today. It's great to see so many people attending our latest webinar of our Hydroterra webinar series. Today, the topic is 101 on telemetry solutions and the Internet of Things, which is obviously an area that is growing massively at present with with a real diversification of telemetry options from satellite to LoRaWAN and many more. We're lucky today to have a real expert in this field, Matt Saunders from Unidata, who is gonna take us through all things telemetry. But before we get into that, I'm going to do a few housekeeping chores. I would, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. I also pay my respect to their elders, past and present. There's a picture of Matt, who's presenting with us today, and uh, I'm Richard Campbell, the Managing Director of Hydroterra. Matt is the General Manager of Unidata, and many thanks for joining us today, Matt. What we love here at our Hydroterra webinars is to get lots of your questions. A big part of why we do this is to get closer to yourselves and get to understand the market needs. So we like questions. But when you're making a question, please use the Q&A button at the top of your screen to register the question. Uh, don't use the chat function because it just makes it difficult to uh, ask two lots of uh, questions. So use the Q&A button and we look forward to lots of questions. A little bit about our webinar series. It's really about sharing knowledge. We are in the fortunate position of having many specialists in environmental monitoring and telemetry, of which uh, we have one today in Matt. And uh, we see ourselves as the marketplace. Uh, we're really evolving Hydroterra to be able to provide a very broad range of technologies for environmental monitoring. And we like to be able to share the knowledge. There is a wealth of knowledge both in our suppliers and also in our customers. So we like to share the podium around to share the knowledge between you all. So we are facilitating education and I think uh, we've had thousands of people attend our webinars this year and it's been really something that's been a, a pleasing, you know, a somewhat tough year in terms of COVID. Uh, we are looking to be an industry leader and that means in our context, bringing technology to market and sharing that knowledge. And uh, that's a big part of why we're here today. So before we charge into our webinar, just a little bit of background about our guest speaker, Matt Saunders. So Matt is currently general manager at Unidata. He has held that position there for the last 15 years and is doing a very good job there. Uh, Matt's got an amazing career spanning more than 50 years and uh, he really has spent a lot of time focusing in on telemetry and satellite communications. Uh, he started off working for NASA uh, at the Carnarvon Satellite Station many years ago when there were lots of moon launches going on um, and they needed, NASA needed to be able to communicate with those astronauts and uh, Matt was uh, involved in supporting that effort. He then uh, moved on to Hewlett Packard for a period of time, somewhat uniquely was actually trained directly by the founder, David Packard. Not many of us can claim that. Um, he then started a software company, which was somewhat unique in its market application, focusing in on submarine communications and uh, that was a very successful venture that was ultimately sold. Um, he then had a period of time at Telstra where he was known for writing very large checks for 
uh, communications and software development um, before moving on to Unidata. So Matt provides us with a unique context, both of what the industry used to be like and what he sees as the future for the industry. So without further ado, I will hand over to Matt. And this is Matt, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. And Richard, thank you for your uh, kind words at the, uh, the start. Uh, I must, I certainly sound old. I've done lots of things if I've uh, worked for NASA in the past, but it's been a great ride and I've really quite enjoyed it. And uh, for this, this session, uh, we want to talk about telemetry and the IoT. There's a lot of technical content here, and, uh, and I hope that you will go away with a better understanding of how we approach telemetry and this mysterious thing called the IoT. So away we go. Away we go. Uh, first, the slide is telemetry and the IoT. Telemetry and the IoT are the same. Transfer of sensor data from the sensor to the central computer using a data logger or a communicator. We've called it telemetry for many, many years. Now telemetry is called the IoT. Same thing. This is the internet's changing. Originally, the internet was built for website traffic in the, many, many years ago. Now it's used for data rich applications, such as Netflix, YouTube, Facebook. But increasingly, the internet is being used for IAT traffic, carrying sensor data across the internet. Now, we've got a couple of fun questions here um, to keep you uh, uh, interested. Uh, three questions, pretty simple questions. How much of the internet capacity is carried by satellite and how much is carried by other systems such as submarine cables? That's the first fun question. The second fun question is when was the first satellite video broadcast from Australia and where was it from? And the third question is a bit of history. How many submarine cables were landed uh, from the sea to Australia? And let's talk about 1900, 1960, 1970, and where we are today. But interestingly, the measure they used to say was how many simultaneous phone calls could have in each era. That's three fun questions, and the answers will be at the end of the presentation. And uh, no internet searching, it's just a yes and for a bit of fun. Now, why would you use telemetry or the IAT? Telemetry and the IAT costs are decreasing. Telstra Sims now for this sort of telemetry, they're down to about $2 a month. That's pretty cheap and they're going down even further. The thing that's happening is, well, that's going down, site costs, that site are going up, maybe two and a half thousand per event. You've got, if you go to a site, a remote site, you need to take a ute, if it's too far, you need to have some medical assistance and site cost is substantially higher. So while this, Telecoms is coming down, site visit costs are going up. And generally there's a requirement for health and safety when you're visiting a site, that health and safety requirement is going up. And also we're in a pandemic, so we have restricted travel. So monitoring remotely is clearly a good option and it's getting cheaper. Let's talk about some of these uh, project components. I've got this slide, I've got another slide I'll go on to. The projects, such projects we have, first we have sensors to measure the parameters. That's pretty simple. There are some of the complicated sensors, but they are sensors. Um, we have a remote data logger to record the measurements. 
We then have a communication system to get the measurements across the internet in some way, and a central computer to receive and record those readings. A couple of common industry terms I'll talk about. One is a network server, handles the communications and the data flow, and application server that displays, presents, and processes the data. And these terms are quite common in the IoT industry. They've only started in the IoT when the IoT was named for territory maybe seven or eight years ago. But keep those things in mind a network server and application server. And now we're going to talk about sensor interfaces. Um, if you have a sensor to measure the environment, they'll be one of these. It'll either be an analog voltage, 0 to 5 volts, or 4 to 20 milliamps. You, funny thing, what's the difference? Right? They're exactly the same. 4 to 20 milliamps is the number of milliamps through a certain level of resistor, certain resistor value. Um, however, if it actually is measuring on current rather than voltage, 4 to 20 milliamp interfaces are generally better long cable runs, and that's generally more used in industrial applications. 0 to 5 volts is generally for shorter cable lengths and more in the environmental space, but uh, most data loggers will be able to do both. We then have digital inputs or relay contacts. There are also sensor interfaces that are op options. Um, these analog and digital inputs tend to be going down in the industry and what's going up is the smarter interfaces. SDI 12 is standard data logger interface 12 which the USGS invented some years ago uh, and instrument manufacturers have aligned to that. There's also another one called Modbus which was invented in 1960s and that provides many sensors and control points and that's more of an industrial focus. So if you buy instruments, they like to be any of these types of options. But generally, if your data logger uh, is a good one, you'll be able to do all of those. Now, this is a bit of a busy slide. Um, communications, how to transfer data to the central computer. There are so many different technologies here, and that's really a minefield for people uh, sort of so many different choices. Yeah, I don't know where you've. LoRa is very is uh, considered uh, pretty good in the in the IoT space. We look at all these other ones. There's also Bluetooth and all of these different names. We also have the satellite providers, Inmarsat and Iridium, for example, and LTE, which is the uh, 4G in the cell phone system. So all of these are different technologies, and we're going to now try and explain something about the differences with those technologies. This is a sort of getting a bit technical. There are technology groups. First technology group is an LP WAN radio solution. That's LoRa, Sigfox and Zigbee. These are unlicensed, which means you don't have to apply for spectrum and they can be deployed without any regulatory approvals. And they're best described as low power low bandwidth, long range Wi-Fi. And I've got a table to explain these differences in a moment. Then we have cell phone acquired solutions, and that's on, uh, we call LTE, 4G and 5G and private LTE. LTE is a funny word. LTE is, it stands for long term evolution. This was going to be the last cell phone technology. This is the final, Technology that was the best. Well, that didn't last long. Now we're up to 4G. So, funny name for it, but essentially 4G. It exists, in, it exists in a licensed or managed or regulated frequency spectrum, and then it's being deployed worldwide by cell phone companies. And they and they work fine. And your your iPhone and your and your Samsung phone work on them as well. We have satellite solutions, and uh, station or low earth orbit satellites. They're also licensed and managed well and regulated. And uh, existing networks and new networks tend to be more expensive, uh, obviously. But prices likely to decline as the microsatellite networks become more viable and more robust. And we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, this slide's pretty important. Uh, it actually talks about the different technologies 
and some aspects of them. Uh, if you remember, we've got Bluetooth, but that's a very short range technology. And that's good for a smartphone to a speaker or, or maybe uh, you know, a thing for about five meters or something like that. We then have Wi-Fi, which is good for up to maybe up to 100 meters. Uh, note that these are all unlicensed. We then have LP WAN, it's that LoRa thing you might have heard about. And they say that's good for 10 kilometers. Well, maybe, certainly two or three kilometers. It is unlicensed. And uh, in the cities, you would use that for uh, perhaps reading a, a water meter or an electricity meter. Um, if we have uh, LP WAN or a thing on a remote farm, perhaps you'd use that for soil moisture sensors. Uh, um, or LP WAN is interesting application on a ship um, for container tracking. Uh, that's, uh, that's to measure all the uh, have a have a, uh, a ping from all the containers to say what temperature in the container or something like that. Uh, so there, but they're all unlicensed, which means you don't have to apply for frequency spectrum licensing for those. That's a good thing and a bad thing. If it is unlicensed, it's, it's inverted commas free. However, um, you have to administer it. And if there's someone else in your area and they're causing congestion, it's your problem. Right? So, uh, and you've got to manage them. So while they're free, it requires a, a level of management that maybe you don't want. We talk of cell phone technology. The uh, number of kilometers goes up, of course. And we all know this. The, Ulster and many other cell phone companies in Australia provide that service. They're licensed, which means they choose a frequency that can't be interfered with by someone else. So they're pretty predictable. Right? And also they have uh, sort out congestion themselves. And uh, so licensed, a licensed service will always be uh, uh, more reliable or easy, uh, sort of easier to implement. We then have satellite systems, uh, an equatorial satellite, is 50,000 kilometers away, and that's licensed worldwide. And we have these lower micro satellites and lower Earth orbit satellites. Uh, I'll just remind you, this one's 50,000 kilometers above the Earth. This one's 500 kilometers above the Earth. Uh, they're different orbit geometry, and the different orbit geometry gives them different operating parameters that is important in the telemetry business. So oh, now let's look at the data payload and service examples uh, for each of these different technologies. The LP WAN, do you remember that's like the LoRa? It provides a simple message-based service. Sigfox is 12 bytes, others are a bit more, but essentially it's like a text message, a short text message. There's usually no acknowledgement. Uh, the industry calls it send and pray, and you hope that it gets there. Uh, mostly it does, but sometimes it doesn't. Uh, um, uh, they often use standard protocols such as MQTT, which is a publish and subscribe protocol. This is a developing standard for these, or not a developing, it's a significant standard. Uh, IBM invented it uh, for how, how you deal with these little messages. Uh, and data can be in web services from an MQT, MQTT server. This is a bit of a worldwide standard for these. It's a good thing. We then talk about cell phone payload and service examples. A cell phone, a 4G LTE, moving up these, these numbers, um, it's a full two-way IP communication that can be acknowledged. It can be guaranteed for an application and uh, narrow, narrowband LTE, which is like a, a, a smaller bandwidth that you, it, if you have your iPhone or your Samsung phone, you can get 35, meg, 35 or 40 megs bandwidth across that uh, if you need it. Uh, if you purchase uh, telemetry uh, SIM cards, you have a very slow speed, 64 kilobytes. That's huge, plenty for sensors, and it's cheaper. Uh, there's also good what we call over the air management loggers in the field if you use the cell phone technology. So the cell phone is pretty good. It's, it's very reliable, it's very good, and it's very cheap. 
Now let's talk about satellite. Because while cell phones are great, um, uh, sometimes there's no cell phone coverage. What are you going to do there? Um, there are satellite solutions. There are two types of solutions. So satellite, which I uh, talked of in the table. There's geostationary and low Earth orbit satellites or microsatellites. They also have the same data payload, like an SMS text message, uh, and which arrives in a short time. Iridium, which is a current leader, so they would come through in under 30 seconds. The microsatellite people, they're delivered in a few hours. So we see that the emerging message based microsatellite options are not robust enough yet, but they will be soon, quite soon, and that will be a significant issue in our industry. Of course, we've got our high end Inmarsat VGAN, which is a full IP, very reliable, and it's like a cell phone in terms of the service quality, and it's from anywhere in the world, and it revives in one second. This is clearly top shelf um, type of uh, telemetry, and it's a top shelf company, and it's very good, extremely reliable. We'll talk about some of the deployment issues with that in the next few slides. Just to remind people about the difference between LEOs and GEOs, uh, equatorial satellite is so high above the ground that it is it rotates around the Earth at the same speed that the Earth rotates, and it is apparently stationary. So if you've got an Inmars sat satellite, for example, or a geostationary satellite um, uh, above the Indian Ocean, then it just stays there. You think it's it's stationary? It's not. It, it's it's orbiting. The same speed as the Earth's orbiting, so it's apparently stationary from one point in the Earth. To achieve that orbit, it's got to be a long way away, 3,000 kilometres. It's got to be a high power uh, satellite. Uh, and if we compare that with the low Earth orbit satellites, which are maybe 500 kilometres above, um, they are much smaller. But because they're so close to the Earth, their orbit is around in about an hour so instead of uh, uh, being in one spot uh, these around the earth to give a comparison in terms of size and cost equatorial orbit satellite is is the size of a bus it's like a double decker bus and typically they cost five billion and uh, they have to have a huge launch vehicle but they last for many many years maybe 10 years so they'll be a service life if you go down to these little small ones, uh, the traditional low Earth orbits that we're used to familiar with, which is Iridium and Global Star, they're about the size of a rubbish bin, and they maybe cost uh, five billion, five million each. But there are many of them. These are like orbiting cell phone towers, whereas this is a, uh, a single thing. The usage of these different types, the discussion of the orbits and so on an effect on how we're going to use it for telemetry. So let's move on with that. Um, if you have a low Earth orbit system uh, in, in the, uh, uh, this is the business model or the technical model for Iridium. Um, if you can see that a user in one country sends a signal up to the satellite, which is only 500 kilometers above the Earth, don't forget, then you can't see a base station. If it's got to collect a message, you can go bounce across several satellites and come down in one in one ground station. Because the Iridium system has carried US military traffic in the past, they will not allow it to be used, have any other ground stations other than one in Arizona. So it's very secure, but you cannot have what we call IP traffic. You've got to have message-based traffic because it takes a few seconds for it to get around and down to the ground station. Another consideration when we're talking of uh, satellite technology is the uh, the ground, what the uh, the ground conditions are when you're using these. This is a pretty simple slide. These users on the ground here can see these. Earth orbit satellites passing by, and they can also have a direct line of sight to this equatorial satellite in the sky. So 
they, they perform the same on that on that in that in that situation. However, if you're in a very hilly place, uh, you may be down in, in the in the valley, but your view towards the equatorial satellite may be shaded. So, if that was where the equatorial satellite was, and you're down here, you've got a problem. Uh, you won't be able to see it. So, if you're using an equatorial satellite, you've got to understand the ground topology to determine uh, whether it's going to work or not. Um, and also, we all measure streams and rivers, and of course, streams and rivers run at the bottom of the valley. So, it's an important consideration right, to to be aware that you could get stumped if you use a if you use a Leo. You'd have to do a site survey to figure out where the satellite is in the sky, and there are plenty of online tools to do that, but it's something that needs to be checked and you could get caught. Whereas these LEO satellites just pass across uh, uh, every hour and you're bound to catch one sooner or later. This is a brief summary of all the microsatellites planned and launched. It's a, it's a slide that comes up every year. You can look on the internet, but look how many there are. So many of them, right? And uh and and which ones are going to survive um uh, we see a lot of them uh, attaining investor funds saying they've got a better idea they'll be able to uh, make their satellites cheaper but there are so many in the market uh, we suspect not many will succeed so which one do you choose pretty tough call we've got a few views on that but at the moment it's very busy down there in terms of these uh, these people. Let's look at the data capacity and costs for these different uh, technologies. Uh, firstly, the IAP traffic is a tiny amount of data uh, when, when compared with running video over your, your cell phone. Image costs are really, really cheap and they're getting cheaper, a dollar to five dollars a month perhaps and you get many kilobytes of capacity. So it's, it's uh, very cheap and it'll carry more capacity than you need. Right? And it's forecast to become cheaper. The other thing to consider is as narrow band LTE rolls out, the cell tower range increases. And it's a pretty simple communications principle, right? The, uh, um, you narrow the bandwidth, you double the range, or halve the bandwidth, you double the range. Not exactly that, but close, right? So uh, we'll find uh, Telstra and the like off, uh, offering to uh, have cell phone coverage double what the cell tower has now if you use it for telemetry and you have this very narrow band cell uh, phone service. A caution though, um, in country areas, telcos are never going to deploy a cell tower where there's only a few customers. So if, uh, if there are not many customers, then expect them to put a cell tower in. Let's talk about satellite data capacity and costs. You need to do a data budget if you're, trying to get, if you're going to do satellite. Um, let's go through these again. The Inmarsat, GAB again, very good, robust, full IP service, uh, but less convenient because it's got a little baby pizza box antenna. You got to point the thing. Now, sure you can do it, um, but you have to take care of the pointing and make sure you point in the right direction. Uh, it does need more power, and it, you probably need a solar panel power, and it's medium cost, right? Which is maybe depends on how much data you've got. You know, the ones we're using are you know, sort of around maybe forty dollars a month typically, but it's the it's, it is the strongest and most robust system. Uh, but you've got, you got to point the antenna and you've got to decide whether that's important or not. Right? Um, we then have the next one down the, on the list, which is Iridium. It's a LEO. It has the short burst data service. It's robust. It's a convenient small antenna. The antenna is like the size of a, uh, uh, what's the size sort of, uh, like half, half, an, half the size of an iPhone and uh, it's always on. And the, 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 that's low cost if the data is low, typically 20 bucks a month. Then we have the emerging LEO microsatellites, and these are soon to be robust services. 
with hourly or daily tactics that can lie passes and only a small message size, but they'll grow. And typically they'll be five bucks a month. So maybe even less. So these will be coming online soon. They haven't we, our view is they're not robust enough yet, but we keep an eye on them. They will be very, very soon. Let's talk about the, if we talk about message based satellite capacity. Um, and these are some of the, uh, we also got showing some of the new micro satellites here. If I remind you about Iridium, good link margins, and 40 byte messages, very convenient right? and robust. Um, the next one down from that is Swarm Space. Um, the trials uh, and early commercial service, 200 byte data messages, pretty good. At the moment, they've got three satellite parts a day, very convenient antenna. It's a startup business case with good investors. In fact, they're substantially good investors because SpaceX have, uh, have purchased them in, in recent months. And that means that they have got huge amounts of money to continue to develop that uh, develop that system. But more as importantly, uh, because SpaceX owns them and SpaceX controls the launch vehicles, then they'll be able to launch many satellites at a significantly lower cost to any all the other people. So our money is on Swarm. Right? We think Swarm is going to be uh, the place to be. Um, We've also got others like Hyber, um, trials, 144 bytes. And of course, in Australia, we've got Miriota. They're pretty good. Uh, they've got a commercial service, but their payload's too slow, it's too small. Um, 20 bytes of data, actually get a few messages a day, but in our view, there's just not enough capacity to do anything serious with Miriota. And uh, good people, but we just don't think it's big enough. Now, when we talk of the telemetry options available from Unidata, here's a pretty simple slide. It's a bit foggy, I'm sorry, but it says that Unidata has a range of data loggers from big ones to medium size to small ones to tiny ones. And all of those, in general terms, provide can be connected with any of these connectivities. So, uh, we generally have a module that plugs into these that does most of all of those. The bigger ones obviously do all of them, smaller ones do most of them. So uh, we have a we have a principle of having a logger, the communication system to get to get across the network, and they're, they're the options. And here you can see that's our LoRa module, that's the Iridium module, it's the Microsoft module, and that's a, that's the cellular module. They're all about the same physical size. Uh, uh, and of course, different data things which we've talked about. In terms of the Unidata system, we talked before that we have a network server and an application server, and that's what we call our NEON system. A NEON system's been around for about 15 years, and it is significant. We have some NEON servers which have in excess of 5,000 connected units. That's a big number. Uh, and they're all working away well. So uh, uh, it's a substantial, it's, a, it's scalable, it's a, it's a good size. Uh, the NEON system architecture, here we see we have instruments going through a NEON logger to a cell tower or to a satellite, and then through the internet and onto the NEON server. This is actually a pretty important slide when we talk of telemetry. Um, this is our logger architecture. We have process signals on this side, the sensors. We go into the logger and we have a program running inside this logger to read these sensors. They could be different types of sensors. We just have a different program for different sensors. And it quietly logs away this data. and has uh, had that process runs all the time. There's an independent process called the communicator. And you set the communicator to send the data to the server on a schedule. If we were doing groundwater monitoring, for example, we would want to send the data once a day. 
So this would be logging away, and then once a day it would wake up, establish a, a communications path, send the data, close it down. But it's because this process is independent of this process, if this can't get onto the server for some reason, uh, uh, logger continues working and just backs up the data until the communications path becomes available. So you don't lose data. You can, the memory in this is such that you can back up data for some years uh, in the event that the communications system is not available. And that's a big deal. Um, one of our uh, customers is the Royal Irrigation Department in Thailand. They have many of these systems um, and uh, had a situation where the government changed all of the IP communication uh, addresses they, and they lost, they lost their IP number and suddenly everything stopped working and they said this is a big problem and they worked hard to re-establish their IP number through the government internet arrangements and they were concerned that however they, they, they were missing their comms for three weeks uh, but when they re-established the comms all of these loggers in the field uh, continued there seeking the, the communications channel and then suddenly it found a communication and it backloaded all the uh, back, backfilled all the data so having a logger in the field that is independent with the logging and the communications functions is a is a big deal in our view it means that you can survive a, la a lack or a loss of the communication system for a period and communication systems do go down servers do go down so it's always good to have a backup in the field in the logger. This is just a few screens of the NEON system. We have a demo on our website. You can have a look on the website and have a look, uh, but just in, in as a handful of snapshots, the login screen. We have our referencing with Google Maps. Uh, we have a list of sensor names, various things on the side here. You can see down here we have uh, a list of folders or list of loggers. Here we also, uh, in the loggers tab, we have what we call over the air management or configuration. And if you look here, if we want to reprogram one of the loggers in the field, we can then simply upload a new program. And the next time the, the, next time the logger communicates and delivers its data, uh, the NEON service is, oh, I've got a new program for you. And it downloads a new program. We can also do resets, we can do grief firmware, we can do all sorts of things over the air. And that's the air is a, is a big productivity boost. We can't do absolutely everything over the air, but to be able to avoid a site visit is a big deal. If, you, if you're saving a lot of money, if you, if you avoid a site visit. And in COVID times, we obviously can't do site visits. So whatever you can do from the local office on the web browser is, is very important. And now we have graphics. This is the sort of the application server part of it, where you can graph things and display things, uh, and then you have uh, different ways to present the data and different ways to report the data out. This is another important aspect. While this is a IoT network server and application server, most people for this this is not the end game. The end game is often another end system. Some of big corporates would have like a historian that they want to keep all the data in. Some have a choice of a different uh, uh, analysis package. And with the NEON system, you can choose to report that data out by a range of services. The old fashioned way was email or FTP. Now it's web services. So. Uh, so this is not the end game. The end game is some downstream analysis system. Another thing at near, nearing the end here, another thing is, is about power. A power budget is always needed for remote systems. This is an example. If you have two lithium batteries in a main unit of a very small logger for two five, two to five years, if you add an extra, extra couple of lithium batteries, it's good for five to 10 years. That's a big deal. You don't have to have a solar panel. Right? Um, uh, if for a, this would work well in a groundwater situation, 
it would work well if you were having a limited number of data points. Um, the battery life obviously depends on the logging and the communication schedule. So uh, this is the Nirvana. This is where people would like to be to be able to have a system which lasts five up to ten years, which is exceeds the life of the technology, uh, and uh, not having to be an inconvenient solar panel. Some applications can do that. If you're trying to measure every 15 minutes or five minutes, this is not strong enough. But after a few readings a day, you can do that. So you've got to remember that power is very important. And if you have a solar panel on site, sure, most of our systems have solar panels, but it is more obvious and less, more, more likely to be uh, analyzed. Now we're coming to the close to the end. Uh, and uh, I wonder whether you've thought about these questions. How much the internet capacity is carried by satellite? How much is carried by other systems? The answer is more than 95% is fiber optic submarine cables or other cables. Whoops. Uh, everyone says, oh, satellites have half, half the capacity. No, it's not. And it's not because it is fiber. Yeah, it's fiber has huge capacity. We're doing and uh, with uh, it's all about fiber optic screen rituals and i can uh, i'm on the way tiny amount of uh, uh, yeah. capacity but uh, in our industry the satellites are very important because they have reach and, and we don't need a lot of mobile or something like that i can speak to him yes yeah, so the next question was when the first satellite we had broadcast from australia well it was 1966 and it was from carnarvon western australia you can look on the internet you can see uh, the first broadcast from london to Carnarvon, 1966, not, not, not that long ago, really, um, but we, that, that's the first video broadcast ever. The other answers is how many submarine cables were landed. This is a bit of telecom's history. Um, in, the 19, in 1900, there was a single wire telegraph that sent Morse code telegrams, it landed in Darwin, certainly no voice, um, and there was a, it went through Alice Springs. So uh, we had very little communications in, in, the, in those, those years. In, 19, in the 1960s, we had our first submarine cable. It we had little valves in it, like, your, uh, like the old radio. Uh, and it was a Commonwealth country cable, so it was called Compact. It had, a, it had 100 voice channels. People measured in that. And I've tried to put an approximate number of megabits, maybe with half a megabit. Uh, that's in 1960s. In 1970s, there was a, a cable across the Atlantic from Australia to Sydney. Uh, that was in 1970. In 1980, from 1980 to 1980,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000
Q&A? Yeah. Yeah, what was, what was we... I, I can do the share screen if you wish. That might be better. Thanks, Matt. Here we go. We have no takeaways. Tell me when to change the screen. About now, thanks, Matt. Okay. So we've learned a lot from Matt today. Um, I suppose from a commercial point of view, and certainly what Hydroterra focuses on is when we're designing monitoring systems with our clients, we, we always look at the cost benefit. I'm often surprised at um, how long it's taken industry to really embrace telemetry. It's certainly increased over the period of COVID uh, where it was difficult for people to get out and do manual measurements. But certainly with those downward pressures of lower telemetry costs, and uh, more sophisticated ways of displaying data in an automated reporting way, um, there's a lot of value with moving to automated systems driven by telemetry. Um, a lot of the time uh, we get excited about such things as um, these new satellite networks and that sort of thing, but my advice to you is that there are people out there like Unidata who need to appraise those as part of their combined service and Hydroterra needs to do the same thing. So it's often best to go through well-established players rather than saving a few dollars on um, some telco costs because in the end, it's a much more reliable service and it's well supported. Uh, so, Matt you can, uh, was you uh, pointing out the um, strengths yep. of cellular phone networks, you know, so Good. the mobile okay. phone okay. network no side of things okay. I'll wait for you. Thank you. versus yeah. other oh, platforms oh. such as LoRaWAN. I tend to agree. Uh, we, we have all sorts of networks that we've deployed at HydroTerra. Um, if you've got close proximity to the sites that you're working on, uh, and you have technical instrumentation technicians and electronic engineers, then you know, it's easy to embrace LoRaWAN. However, if, if, there's, if, if there's any distance or substantial distance to go to site, then you are much better off with your cellular networks, simply because someone else is being paid to maintain that telemetry network. Okay, so never forget the LoRaWAN network is a telemetry network and your big mobile phone companies such as Telstra have very large workforces to maintain their telemetry networks and uh, they have the efficiencies of scale. So it makes a lot of sense to do that. Next slide, thanks, Matt. So in terms of satellite telemetry, even though satellite um, costs are coming down a lot. Uh, if you have cellular phone coverage, use it. If you don't, embrace satellite. Uh, the great thing about satellite is typically you can deploy anywhere. Okay, so you heard about making sure it's configured to the right type of satellite from that. You know, um, some of those topographic features can get in the way of geostationary satellites, but these uh, micro satellites that are emerging will be, you know, very strong in a couple of years. Um, but what I've found over the years is um, satellite is great in remote locations. We typically do blended systems. If we have uh, cellular coverage, we'll use that, but often, uh, like I can think of some big networks we've got up in Queensland where it's about 20% on, uh, on uh, satellite and the remainder on cellular, and that works well. Uh, that system's actually underpinned by um, Unidata. Um, Matt's recommending that we use an experienced telemetry vendor. I couldn't agree more. Uh, you really just don't need the headaches um, and they're all getting much, much cheaper. The competitive forces that are coming to play with respect to telemetry are driving 
all the operators' prices down. And you saw an example of how low Telstra's gone. You know, two dollars a month for a sim is extraordinary. You know, so um, satellite numbers are coming down too. I sometimes worry that there's not going to be enough money for the various telcos to actually maintain their networks, but um, I guess the volume's going up. Hopefully um, that all works out. Uh, next slide, thanks, Matt. So now over to the questions, and thanks very much for those questions you've sent through. Um, we will get on and start reading those. Yes, hello, this is Matt Sorter speaking. Uh, I just can see uh, four questions. Uh, one is from Giuseppe, and uh, he's asking, uh, is it possible to have a copy of the video? Yes, it is on the HydroCarrot website. And also, Giuseppe has also asked a couple of other questions, but relating to the marketplace regarding skilled people of working and managing remote technology. Uh, the people that... Uh, there are two skills involved in this telemetry IoT business. One is the computer and uh, sort of software skills of someone uh, dealing with the uh, application server and the in, in office people essentially, or working from home people. And the people that are in the field are generally electronics technicians or electronics engineers. And there's no particular uh, uh, skills shortage in that area, right? This, uh, uh, they're uh, uh, just normal uh, qualified technicians or engineers can do that work. I met. Uh, we don't. We just have one more question. Uh, it's from anonymous attendee. Um, how great have you found the Telstra NBIoT uh, dash can uh, cat M M1 coverage maps to be? I'm sorry. Could you just repeat that question, please? Yes, it is. Uh, how great uh, have you found the Telstra and BIoT? Yes. That's anyone coverage maps to be. I'm not a hundred percent sure of your question, but the uh, uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure of the question. However, uh, if you're asking about Telstra and the IoT uh, cell phone range. Uh, there are two classes of service from Telstra. One is a normal cell phone type service, which is uh, allows you to stream uh, uh, like stream video to your iPhone and the like. Uh, and that's not the type of service we need for telemetry. What we need for telemetry is the lower rate service and uh, typically down to 64 kilobits. And that is the service that we need. Uh, and uh, there are various levels of that service uh, it's a little bit complicated. There are, there are two or three options for that, but essentially it's a it's a low bandwidth service, and the low bandwidth service is also at the low uh, one or two dollars a month cost from Telstra. So 
uh, that's the one you should use. Also, if you're using the low bandwidth services from Telstra, bear in mind that because it is a lower bandwidth service, the range from the cell tower has in, is increased. There is a rule of thumb that says it doubles the range of the cell tower. It doesn't quite do that, but it certainly uh, dramatically increases the reach or the range of the signal from that cell tower, which is a big deal for us. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Matt. Um, well, uh, thank you everyone for, for coming to this webinar. And uh, thank you, Matt and Richard for the great presentation as well. And we hope um, have you guys uh, join in the next webinar at Hydrotel soon. Happy Christmas and Happy New Year. See you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.